I'm Jacob Courtright, and this is The Locker Room. Hello and welcome into The Locker Room. Before we get started, this episode of The Locker Room is brought to you by FNX Fitness. That is FNXFit.com for all your fitness and supplement needs. Make sure you use the promo code at checkout, TLRHOST. That is TLRHOST, all capitals, for 15% off your order from us here at The Locker Room to you at home. Make sure you follow The Locker Room on Twitter, TLR with Jacob. On Instagram, The Locker Room Podcast 615. On Facebook, The Locker Room Host Jacob. And on TikTok, The Locker Room 22. Now let's get started. As always, you know what time it is here at the Locker Room, Sunday show out or Monday makeover. And this week, we have a lot of redemption stories because the first game I'm going to talk about is the Bengals versus the Jaguars. And yes, I could go Monday makeover for the Jacksonville Jaguars as they have had poor showings the last couple games, but I have got to go Sunday show out for Joe Burrow getting the Cincinnati Bengals their first win. And it seems like franchise history it's been so long and I want to start with this first point when it comes to the Cincinnati Bengals first off Joe Burrow had a great game 25 of 36 300 yards a touchdown he did have an interception also Joe Mixon you can't ignore what he did on the offensive side with 25 carries 151 yards and totaling two touchdowns in that game but what I enjoy about this Cincinnati Bengals team is they are slowly becoming a respected franchise once again They are no longer the Jacksonville Jaguars of the North, but they are just a bad football team in the North, and that is more respectable than being a horrible organization. It seems like they've got their feet in the right direction, now they just got to keep walking, and it all starts on the young shoulders of Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is proving that not only is he there to turn this franchise around, but he is there to make them winners once again. Joe Burrow is not somebody who's going to sit on the sidelines and be okay with going two and nine for the rest of his career. He is somebody that is going to continually push this Cincinnati team to be better. And that's what I appreciate so much about that young man for stepping up in such a hard role to to step up in, in the sense that you are now a starting quarterback for a horrible, for horrible team. But they are becoming a respected franchise. They are now losing games 33 to 25. They're now tying with the Eagles, who right now are sitting atop their division. So when I say that they're becoming respectable, I'm not saying by any means that they're a great team or that they are going to you know, try and make a wild card or a playoffs. They are still probably two to three years away from being in the conversation of building this franchise back to what it needs to be. But what I'm saying is that they are losing closer games. They are giving teams competition. Joe Burrow is pushing the envelope. He pushed the Browns on Thursday night, who just beat the Dallas Cowboys, which is everybody's favorite to not only win their division, but maybe even be a dark horse for the Super Bowl. So what these Cincinnati Bengals are doing is they are making the conversation easier to, making that that, that conversation easier to have, making that pill easier to swallow. You can be a respected franchise and still be bad. That we've seen it year in, year out. We've seen respected teams like UCLA back in the day was a respected team. They have been bad for several years, but now under Chip Kelly are slowly getting closer victories, closer losses. So they're becoming more respectable, and that's all you can ask for especially in Joe Burrow's first year, is to make this organization respectable. So not only for me is it a Sunday show out for the Cincinnati Bengals getting their first win of the season, but it is a Sunday show out for Joe Burrow and, of course, Joe Mixon, but what they are doing for this organization, turning them in the right direction. I love the direction that they're going. Cincinnati, you should be proud once again to finally have a team that at least competes and has heart as opposed to a team that lays over like they used to. This next game, uh, I I don't even know really what to say. I didn't even honestly know where to go from here. So I'm going to give both of these teams a Sunday show out. Uh, one of them is going to get a Sunday show out, and one of them is going to get a Monday makeover. So it's going to be a 2 and one for this game because there was just no way to put it besides Sunday show out for the Cleveland Browns. And that is not something I thought I would be saying. The Cleveland Browns are now 3 and one. Uh, Cleveland Browns Sunday show out. They hung 49 points on the Dallas Cowboys. Baker Mayfield was an efficient 
19 of 30, 165 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, which is a big bright spot. Uh, I mean, Odell Beckham Jr. had a day. Five receptions for 81 yards and two touchdowns, and he also had the rushing touchdown that sealed the game after Dallas crawled all the way back to within three. But Sunday show out for the Cleveland Browns, they came out to Jerry World, and they won the game. They did not accidentally win. They did not get lucky. They did not get a ton of turnovers. They won the game plain and simple. They put the Dallas Cowboys on their butts. They made the Dallas Cowboys have to crawl all the way back uh, and they were in control. There was never one point in that game, even when it got to three points, that I thought, wow, the Browns are going to cough this one up. They are not the Atlanta Falcons. So Sunday show out for the Cleveland Browns. Odell Beckham Jr., what a performance. And on the flip side, the Dallas Cowboys, you are going to earn a Monday makeover once Again, And this is not just because I really don't like the Dallas Cowboys, but it is simply for the fact that Dak Prescott is throwing the ball for empty calories. Ezekiel Elliott is running the ball for empty calories. Amari Cooper is, is catching the ball for empty calories. They are giving up such huge leads, and then they are playing with a sense of, of relaxed, relaxed, relaxedness. Relax, what is that word? Whoever remember, I don't know that word right now, but... They're playing with a sense of, of relaxation. That's the word I was looking for. That they they don't really have the pressure of either being in the lead or being in a close game. So therefore, they're throwing empty calories. Dak Prescott can go for 502 yards and four touchdowns and an interception, and it looks great on paper. Ezekiel Elliott can have 12 carries for 54 yards, but also catch eight targets for 70-plus, and it looks great on paper. Amari Cooper can have 12 receptions for 135 yards and a touchdown, and it looks great on on paper but the problem is when you're down five touchdowns it doesn't matter you shouldn't give a damn about your numbers you should give a damn about winning and the problem is the Dallas Cowboys only care about numbers uh, especially the way they have been playing there's no there's no acceptable reason for you to get down so many touchdowns and then be able to crawl your way back like it's nothing that is an attest that is not only a testament to this Dallas Cowboys franchise, that is a testament to Dak freaking Prescott. Now, I was a big Dak fan when he first came in the league. I was a Dak supporter when people were were, were kind of giving him a hard time. But there is no way, especially after this offseason, him wanting the same money that these big name guys were getting. There was, there was just no way that I could justify Dak Prescott not only getting that money, but Dak Prescott as being a top five quarterback in this league. Yes, his numbers look great. Yes, he's breaking records by doing, you know, throwing X amount of yards per game in a row, over 400 yards for the three straight games is a breaking a record. That is awesome. And as a Dallas Cowboys fan, I'm sure you're happy to see those numbers on uh, Sports Center. And, and I'm sure if you're a fantasy owner of his, as I am, you're happy as can be. But if you're a Dallas Cowboys fan, you are not only. Uh, not only underwhelming for the season so far, but you are disgracing the Cowboys' name because you are in the worst division in the NFL, and that is not debatable. That is not close. I don't want people asking me. That is the worst division in NFL history, I'm almost sure. They, they are just bad football teams over there. You should be the king of the worst if that's the division that you're in. Uh, you put the Jacksonville Jaguars in that division, and they're competing for the number one seed. You put the Bengals in that division, and they're tied for first right now with the with the uh, uh, the Eagles. So if the Eagles are atop your division on one, two, and one, then you are in serious trouble. For Dak Prescott to throw these empty calories, for Ezekiel Elliott to run for these empty calories, for Amari Cooper to catch for these empty calories, uh, it means nothing. Numbers look great, but it means nothing on paper. Their defense, folks, is atrocious. Uh, the people that they have, uh, Alden Smith, yes, he did miss a game, a game saving tackle against you know Odell Beckham Jr., who then raced out uh, for the 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 touchdown. But I watched a safety and a linebacker run completely out of bounds, did not even pursue the ball on that play as well. So you want to complain about Alden Smith making that tackle? Your safeties can't stop anybody. Your wide receivers or excuse me, your corners can't stop any wide receivers that are on the field. People are getting whatever they want on a Dallas Cowboys defense that should be top six, top five even maybe, if they would play the way they have. Uh, Demarcus Lawrence is a waste of money. After he got paid, he has slowly sucked the life out of the Dallas Cowboys defense. 
Uh, he's done nothing. He had one decent hit in the backfield on a crucial third down. Other than that, I'm not even sure Demarcus Lawrence is playing on Sundays. That's how non-noticeable he is is. So if you want to come at me with uh, about the Dallas Cowboys and how they can still win the division, I'm not going to argue with you because I still believe that they can win this division. I still have them winning this division. Uh, there's just horrible teams in this division, but you cannot come at me and say they are not a Monday makeover once again because these numbers and these stats mean nothing when you're taking a big fat L. It's like Shannon Sharp says, come, come to Club Shay Shay, get that L sandwich because you are continually losing games that you should be in control of. Dallas Cowboys, big Monday makeover. This next game uh, that I'm going to choose between is actually quite funny because I got a lot of flack in my video on Monday of my top five Super Bowl contenders after week four of not having these guys in my top five. But I'm going to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady as a Sunday show out over the Los Angeles Chargers. I thought the Chargers looked a lot better. Justin Herbert uh, did a great job, I thought. He had one crucial turnover, as we have seen in his first couple starts. Uh, but they gave up too big of a lead, and a large part of it simply was they were going against the greatest of all time in Tom Brady. Tom Brady, 369 yards, five touchdowns, one interception, which was a pick six. He really didn't need a whole lot of help from the backfield, uh, even though Ronald Jones did rack up 111 yards. Mike Evans was sensational with 122 yards and a touchdown as well. Uh, I'm not saying that the Chargers need a Monday makeover for this one. They are a young team going through young team growing pains, and I completely understand that this is probably going to happen throughout the rest of this year, especially with Justin Ker- Herbert excuse me, at the helm. Uh, they're going to go through growing pains. This simply came down to Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers simply just being better. When you have Tom Brady playing the way he started to play after the third quarter, he was sensational after halftime. Tom Brady was just a monster, and that's why he is the greatest of all time. I've seen this time and time again. People want to say on, on, a, on a Monday after a bad loss that Tom Brady and Father Time's catching up with Tom Brady, but then the very next week you'll see Tom Brady put up performances like this, and that's what proves to people if people just don't like greatness. They'll do the same thing to LeBron that they will to Tom Brady that they've done to several other star players. Is They, they, they crucify him when they do something uh, wrong or when they have a bad day, but then they come back and ball out and then they just go, oh, well, you know, they got lucky or it was the other team's, re, you know, the other team's defense. No, this was simply Tom Brady being great. Tampa Bay, like I've said, and I know I didn't put them in my top five for my Super Bowl contenders after week four, but I told you, I put them, it was tough not putting them up at five. They're around the six, seven range for me right now. They still have a lot of kinks to work out. Like, let's be honest, they're still playing the Chargers. It wasn't like the Chargers are the best team in the division or that the Chargers uh, are, are, are on par with Tampa Bay. The Chargers not only lost Austin Eckler, which was a huge hit for them, uh, but they're starting a young quarterback, a rookie in Justin Herbert, who still needs time to be a good quarterback. I, th- I thought his performances so far have been adequate. They've been good, but he needs time to be better and be great. So Tom Brady simply just choked them out when it was 24 to 7 at halftime uh or actually the the fumble with Joshua Kelly right towards the end of halftime is what really messed everything up uh so with with that being said all I can say is that Tom Brady was a Sunday show out his age seemed to be no factor the Tampa Bay Buccaneers seem to be a team that is on the verge of trying to be Super Bowl contenders this year so this is not more so about what the Chargers need to do but what about Tom Brady and this Tampa Bay Tampa Bay team did and they were short staffed with many injuries in the backfield No Fournette, LaShawn McCoy was fighting an ankle injury, so they got it done. Sunday show out for Tampa Bay. This next one really does hurt me to save, but like I said, I'm here to bring you the truth. I'm here to bring you non-biased opinions. My hometown Chicago Bears versus the Indianapolis Colts. The Indianapolis Colts uh, with another victory here, which is no good for Titans fans. This is one that we really needed them to drop. Uh, But this is going to be straight up a Monday makeover for the Chicago Bears. Bears. Here's here's why it is such a glaring. Uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for without swearing? <laughs> it is such a glaring problem at quarterback for the Chicago Bears. It's unreal. Matt Nagy's system is built for quarterbacks with great accuracy and decent 
deep balls. That's all they have to be. Great accuracy, decent deep balls. If Mitchell Trubisky or Nick Foles could throw an accurate ball 15 yards and in, Matt Nagy would grind you to death. The Bears would win games 14-7 to every Sunday, but they cannot make accurate throws. They are not mobile enough out of the pocket to make accurate throws. They need better quarterback play. And here's why I don't look at the numbers, because if you look at Nick Foles' numbers, he had 249 yards, a touchdown, one interception, and people will go, wow, that's not that bad of a game. But the problem is, is he is not getting it done. He's not moving the sticks enough to make it effective. His last touchdown came with like a minute and 48 left on the clock. Nick Foles has got to be more accurate if he's going to be the guy. The problem they had with Mitchell Trubisky was throwing behind receivers, overthrowing receivers, underthrowing receivers. That is the same problem that they're having with Nick Foles now they have to be accurate otherwise this system with Matt Nagy does not work their defense is on the field 38 minutes of the freaking game and then they expect their defense to clamp them down towards the end and even though this defense played very well yesterday keeping the the Colts to literally field goals and and that's after asking this defense to be out there almost the entire game uh, there's not much more you can do besides be better at quarterback. That is the main reason they are in Monday makeover. The quarterback play is atrocious. As Bears fans, I'm sure we are very upset, as I am. Uh, I cannot stand what I saw. Nick Foles overthrowing, underthrowing, throwing behind. It was just unacceptable. His touchdown came with a jump ball to Allen Robinson with a minute and 40 to go, which was another lucky catch in and of himself especially against a team that that defense was doing very well against. This was a big Monday makeover. They've got to get it figured out in Chi-Town at quarterback. They've got to find somebody or get somebody via trade draft. I don't care. You've got to get another quarterback in there in Chicago. This next game might surprise a lot of people as well. I'm going to go Sunday show out for the Philadelphia Eagles. Eagles get their first win of the season against the San Francisco 49ers. Now, of course, Nick Mullins was the quarterback for the Niners as Jimmy Garoppolo is still out with an ankle injury. Jared McKinnon, uh, the backup running back, had a okay day after having a stout day the other night. But George freaking Kittle, 15 receptions, 183 yards, and a touchdown in his return game. He was sensational. He was phenomenal. But uh, on that side of the ball, uh, it's not necessarily a Monday makeover for San Francisco as they are battling so many injuries right now amongst the team. Uh, Once they are all back to being healthy, they are going to be just fine. But this was a battle of, uh, of wills. This was a battle of, are the Philadelphia Eagles just going to lay over and take this season as a loss and move on to next year in the draft? Carson Wentz, I give you a hard time. I say you're overrated, and that is not usually what I have said about you in the past, but but you came out there and said, hey, listen, I am throwing to nobody. I'm throwing to literal, literally, goodness gracious, I can't talk today, but I'm throwing to literally high school players, uh, <laughs> or they're literally pulling Eagles fans out of the stands uh, and just putting gloves on them and saying, go catch, because I don't even know who he's throwing to. Now, Miles Sanders, uh, their running back, didn't have a great day as well. 13 carries for 46 yards. Uh, I can't even pronounce the guy that scored the touchdown for him. That was crucial. Uh, Fulgleham. Yeah, have you ever heard of him? No, that's right. Neither has anybody else, and I'm pretty sure that they just found out they have a guy named Fulgleham on their team uh, when they activated the roster on Sunday. So Carson Wentz really doesn't have a whole lot of help up there in Philadelphia, so it's hard to really blame him for playing so poorly. This is just a bad Eagles team. But Carson Wentz pushed through. He had a rushing touchdown. He had a throwing touchdown. He did have an interception, but they got the W. And here's the deal. Another reason this is a Sunday show out for me is the Philadelphia Eagles now sit up top their division. It's not like the Eagles are battling for last place. They now are first in their division with 1-2-1. and one. That's how bad that division is, that 1-2-1 and one gets it done to be the leader of your division. But the Philadelphia Eagles, they finally are going to start getting some players back from injury. So hopefully they can start trending in the right direction. Uh, San Francisco, same way. They're, just, they're plagued by injury right now. Once these two teams are fully healthy, I think we'll see a much better Eagles team that does have the chance to win the division. And we have a San Francisco team that should win their division once again, even though they've got some other teams in that division playing very well. San Francisco is just better on both sides of the ball when everybody's healthy.
Finally, the last game I'm going to talk about, and yes, I understand that two Monday night games uh, went on last night, but I, I, I'm going to do another NFL segment next week besides the Sunday show out Monday makeover. So those teams are going to be more included in that. So I'm going to go with one last game today. And this was more of a fan favorite. Honestly, there was a lot of people that wrote in about this game. And I know Washington football team or the WTFs continually come up in the show as Sunday or as Monday makeovers and never Sunday show outs. But what I wanted to talk about, and I've talked about this in the video yesterday about why the Baltimore Ravens are my Super Bowl pick, uh, is what I saw on Sunday. Lamar Jackson, 193 yards through the air, two touchdowns and one interception. Lamar, of course, seven carries for 53 yards and a touchdown. But here's what is important about this. This is the the reason that I'm picking Sunday show out for the Baltimore Ravens is they showed the one characteristic that I told you they needed in order to be Super Bowl champions and that is they made Lamar Jackson throw the ball. Now he played against a very good defensive front in the Washington football team or the WTFs, all right? So he played against a very good defensive front, some would even say the best defensive front in all of football uh once Chase Young is healthy and and playing out there actively every Sunday. So what they did was they made him say, hey, we're not going to let you continually run the ball. You're going to have to throw to beat us. And it looked uncomfortable for the first half. Lamar didn't look comfortable throwing the ball or tossing the ball the way he needed to. And then what happened was Lamar Jackson settled in in the second half and threw the ball for strikes, threw the ball for touchdowns, which is what they have to do to be Super Bowl champions. If Lamar can throw with that uh, kind of not only accuracy and velocity, but that much confidence every Sunday, this Baltimore Ravens team has has the possibility of going undefeated the rest of the year. Here's the deal. We're seeing the same offense kind of run in New England where they're making Cam Newton a pure runner of the football, but Cam has to come up big in big moments, and he has so far, and that's the same thing that Lamar Jackson is doing. This offense will work in the NFL if Lamar Jackson can be accurate through the sticks in the air. He's got to be accurate. He's got to be on time. He's got to stop relying on just his legs to get the job done, and what I saw on Sunday was Lamar getting it done throughout the air, and that's why I gave them a Sunday show out Uh, I'm telling you guys, I I talked about this in in the video on Monday about my five contenders. If the Baltimore Ravens can become a passing threat as much as they are a running threat, this is the most unstoppable offense that we might have ever seen in the NFL. They will have no weakness as long as Lamar is accurate. They've got good wide receivers. They've got good tight ends. They've got a running game that is unmatched in the NFL. So it all starts with Lamar Jackson. Can he be accurate? Can he throw the ball down the field? Can he not turn over the ball when he's throwing it? And if that's the case, like on Sunday, they should win easily against, uh, not only against the Washington football team, which is a bad football team, but they should win against uh, teams throughout the rest of the year quite easily. So getting that down, I'm going to give them a Sunday show out simply off of that. So Sunday show out, Lamar, I love seeing you throw the ball. Let's see if you can continue to put that up. Well, there are my Sunday showouts or Monday makeovers for the week. Let me know what you think in the comments, uh, in the DMs. I love hearing from you all. Uh, I know we did have a great doubleheader on Monday. We had the, the Chiefs versus the Patriots, which if Cam Newton was there would have been a great game. And then, of course, we have the Falcons versus the uh, Green Bay Packers. An air raid, air raid, air raid game if there ever was one. Two guys, and Matt Ryan and, of course, Aaron Rodgers, who just want to put the ball through the air, it seems like. Even though Matt LaFleur is trying to make Green Bay a running dynamic team, it just seems like he can't help himself when Aaron Rodgers is playing as good as he is. Uh, Thursday night, we've had some very horrible games. I'm not going to lie. That's one of my biggest complaints with Thursday night. But we officially are starting to get some good games on Thursday as we get Buccaneers versus the Bears. And then the following week, we get Kansas City versus the Buffalo Bills. Both games which are going to be stout, uh, incredible games to watch with stout defenses. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Real quick, let's run down the players of the week list. First and foremost, we're going to go Joe Mixon with 151 yards, two touchdowns. Next, we have got to go Odell Beckham Jr., five receptions, 81 yards, two touchdowns throughout the air, and then one rushing touchdown. Then, of course, even though Dak Prescott had some empty calories, his numbers were still pretty impressive with 502 yards, four touchdowns, one interception, 
Tom Brady makes the Sunday show out list for players of the week, which is not something that he usually makes. Uh, but 369 yards and five touchdowns for a regular season game from Tom Brady, which was quite impressive. Dalvin Cook got back on track with 130 yards and two touchdowns. And finally, George Kittle, the monster at tight end, the best tight end in the entire league, 183 yards and one touchdown in his game back from injury. So those are your players of the week. Next, we are going to do a quick preview of game four of the NBA Finals. So for everybody who is been mess- who has been messaging me, for everybody who has been getting on to me about the Lakers losing to the Heat in Game 3, I want that same energy when the Miami Heat lose big time in Game 4 tonight. I am guaranteeing a Los Angeles Lakers victory, okay? Guaranteeing it. Let's break down the last game just real quick. Jimmy Butler had the best performance from a non-superstar in finals history. Jimmy Butler is not going to the Hall of Fame unless unless he has some miraculous next five years of basketball. He's not going to the Hall of Fame. Jimmy Butler is not considered a top 10 player in the NBA by any stretch of the means. So does that mean that Jimmy Butler is better than LeBron James, for those of you who have messaged me that? Does that mean that Jimmy Butler had the greatest finals performance of all time? No. Out of a non-superstar, he has the greatest finals performance of all time. But out of LeBron has had a 40-point triple-double. Jerry West has had a 40-point triple-double. We've seen Dirk Nowitzki who has had better finals games than Jimmy Butler has had. So we have seen, you know, of course, Kobe, Dwight, or uh, not Dwight, but Shaq. We have seen performances that outweigh what he has done. But from a non-superstar, hats off to Jimmy Butler. He said they weren't going to lose off of his play. I mean, he came out in game three and said they weren't going to, or in game two and said they weren't going to lose, and they took the big fat L. And uh, so he had to back it up with his play, not necessarily just his words. And we saw Jimmy Butler play out of his mind. We saw Jimmy Butler put the team on his back. We saw Kelly Olynyk have a game of his life as well, over 19 points. He was, uh, I think, three of five or three of six from three. So he had Kelly Olynyk playing out of his mind. Jimmy Butler played the best game of his entire career. And yet they still got to a point where they almost lost. And that is because the Los Angeles Lakers are just that much better. LeBron James had an atrocious game. I've told you I am honest from the start. LeBron James had four crucial turnovers in the fourth quarter. He was lazy with the ball. Uh, His attitude really didn't seem like he really cared about that game. Anthony Davis got in foul trouble early, but that is still no excuse for him to only put up 15 points, only take... Uh, uh, less than 10 shots. Like it, it was just a bad night all around. He only got to the free throw line one time. They got out rebounded. They got out hustled. That is what I told you would make the Miami Heat take a game off of them is if they beat them on the rebounds and they beat them in the hustle stats, and they did. But I can guarantee you tonight the Los Angeles Lakers come out focused. The problem you have as a Miami Heat fan is what inspired or transpired after that last game, Jimmy Butler saying, you know, they don't want it. They're scared. It ain't over. You have Tyler Hero mean mugging, which if that's mean mugging, then I, I Tyler Hero looks like uh, a male cheerleader who just did a stunt and is now trying to show off to the crowd. Like, Tyler Hero, no one's scared of you putting your upper lip up and giving us this little, you know, angry face, showing that you're the big dog. So no one's no one's taken away by what you did, Tyler Hero, even though he played very well. You know, you're a little mean mug. The trash talk that has a, uh, transpired from a Miami Heat victory is going to shoot them inevitably in the foot. It has always happened when a LeBron James team gets... Uh, dissed the way they were phys- uh, not only physically dissed by the play, but when they are verbally dissed in public for people to see. We saw it in 2016 when you had Klay Thompson, Steph Curry, uh, Draymond Green coming out and saying stuff about LeBron. What, it ha- what happened then? LeBron did nothing but put up 40 for three state games and win the NBA championship over a record-breaking team. This is going to stay true with the Miami Heat. You are in big, big trouble if you think that you are going to be able to say the things you have said to this uh, Lakers team, about this Lakers team, uh, and in public to the Lakers team via the media and get away with it. It's simply not going to happen. So I fully expect a Los Angeles victory tonight by 
15, maybe uh, maybe a little bit less, but I'm going to stick with 15. I just don't see this game being close. Is is uh, If these starters stay in the entire game, if Bam is out, if Drogic is out, if everybody's still out, this is going to be a blowout of epic proportion. If Bam comes back, I feel like the Miami Heat might be in more trouble because even though Bam's a better player, Bam cannot shoot. So therefore, the Miami Heat can uh, Miami Heat can't uh, open up the lane and put shooters like Kelly Olynyk, who can play center, but also go shoot threes out on the perimeter. So if Bam does come back, now the Miami Heat are going to have the lane packed on them once again with the seven footers and Dwight Javel, and then of course Anthony Davis, and that is what proved them to be an epic uh, mismatch in the first two games. Was when that lane was packed, they simply had nowhere to go. So I fully expect a Lakers blowout tonight. I love the energy that was brought when the Lakers lost. I hope that energy continues. I hope you continually message me. I love it. I love it. I love it. I will never shy away from what I truly believe in my heart, and that is the Lakers in five. So I'm going to continue to stick on that point and preview game three. Lakers by 15. I think Anthony Davis has a record-breaking game for him. I'm going to go somewhere around 30 and 15 for him. LeBron's going to have 25 uh, 10 and 9, uh, probably. I say Jimmy Butler, of course, is definitely going to come back to earth because we have seen that throughout the playoffs, have a great game, and then comes back to reality the next game. Uh, so I say Jimmy Butler is going to have a tougher night. We're going to see Tyler Hero probably <laughs> get put in the pick and roll against LeBron and AD the entire night, and it's going to be a rough night for the young buck. But that's what happens when you trash talk and mean mug. Uh, payback is a coming. So Lakers tonight, love it. If you would like to uh, go against that, please message me, tweet me. I want to start posting this stuff just because it's so much fun for me uh, to completely battle as to why you know LeBron is the best and the Lakers are the best uh, team right now. So make sure you've got me on my social media so we can play along via social media. Uh, it's always fun to get new fans and new listeners to kind of battle against. All right, well, last but not least, we are going to finish up the podcast today with a little top five college football teams just real quick for you. Uh, going to kind of give you the breakdown after uh, the first few weeks. Now, I know a couple of great teams like the Oregon Ducks uh, aren't playing for another few weeks. And, of course, the Big Ten's getting ready to start. So there's a lot of chaos kind of going around um, as to, uh, you know, all, all these teams. But, <clears throat> wait. We are going to move on real quick to college football. I hope you're watching our Saturday Pick'em shows and you're picking along with us. We have another great episode dropping this coming week. You can always re-watch our Pick'em videos with our special guests on our YouTube channel. So make sure you hit the link in the bio so that way you can follow us on our YouTube channel. Subscribe and watch our videos there every Saturday morning, 12 Eastern. So make sure you're following us there. All right, well, let's get to our top five college football teams after the first few weeks of college football. And of course, some of the best teams in the entire country, like the Oregon Ducks, aren't playing for another few weeks. Uh, Ohio State's not factored in because they are not in the game yet, but they all will be shortly. So once they are all in, we can then give a more accurate description. But I'm going to give you my top five after the first few weeks. Number one has got to be Clemson. Simply put it, they have the best quarterback in Trevor Lawrence in the entire country, the number one overall pick in next year's draft, without a doubt. Uh, they have Travis Etney, the running back, who is might be the best running back in all of college football as well. Uh, the way that he can not only catch out of the backfield, but is dynamic between the tackles. I mean, he had 114 receiving yards and a touchdown, and then 73 yards and a touchdown in the backfield. Uh, running it. So, I mean, when you have a player like that alongside you, it is almost impossible to stop that offense. Clemson can't slide out of here uh, for me simply because their personnel is better than everybody else in the country, especially on the offensive side of the ball as of right now. Number two, I'm going to go Alabama. I mean, it's not a shock that Alabama is battling for that number one spot every single year, but they've had good quarterback play, which is something that a lot of people were not expecting this year. So they have good quarterback play. They've had a, a pretty decent offense. Uh, Matt, Matt Jones is uh, doing a great job, 435 yards and four touchdowns. He did have an interception. But uh, Mac Jones is doing just fine. In Bama, you really don't need a dynamic quarterback because you have such dynamic players around you. Uh, I like what I've seen from the backfield. 
Uh, I mean, so they've got some players, but I am not solely sold on this Alabama team. I do not like uh, what they have on their defensive side of the football. Right now, I feel like they're just outscoring teams because they have Waddle. They've got some other good guys on the offensive side of the football. Uh, They have the best offensive line in all of college football as well, so that's always going to be there for them. But defensively, Bama's got some holes, and it it will prove to be a tough year for Bama to get to that national championship. Number three, we are going to go with the Florida Gators. And this is something that I talked about on the College Pickums this week. Florida has the opportunity to come out on top in the SEC this year. They have Trask as the quarterback, who is just a stud. Then, of course, they have their tight end, who is just, he's just been bonkers this year, let's be honest. I mean, what, what they can do from the offensive side of the football with Kyle Pitts and, and, and Trask is it's almost a little bit speechless. They remind me of Clemson in the sense that they have two players in Trask and in Pitts and their tight end that that are very uh, not only very hard to match up with, but are very hard to get off of their game. Florida is the best team in the SEC right now for me, even after seeing Bama play. Bama did play a high school in week one. Um, but I'm definitely going to go Florida for my number three spot. I like what I've seen over there. I like what they're doing on offense. Their defense looks great as well. They have the number one tight end in the country in Pitts. So with all that being said, Florida has to sit at my number three right now. Next up, I am going to go actually in a direction that I was not expecting, but I am leaning towards Notre Dame at my number four instead of my number five. And honestly, after looking at this, I just realized I basically have the top five that are the top five in the country right now. So it's a good thing to know that 99.9% of all of college football, uh, or at least the people that that matter and vote for it, agree with me as well. I'm going to go Notre Dame, though, at number I like what Notre Dame has going on for them. I I more so like the experience that they are bringing back at the quarterback position and, of course, at the running back position. Notre Dame is one of those teams that um, they can surprise you in a lot of different ways. They've got a lot of big games this year. Uh, so Notre Dame's going to sit at number four for me simply because I did not like what Georgia did in week one. So that's why I'm going to go Notre Dame here at four. Let's go ahead and move on to number five, Georgia. Georgia, when they have um, consistent quarterback play, are a very good team. Georgia's that team that is on the verge of being one of the best you know, SEC teams every single year. It just seems like they can never find a consistent enough quarterback play to do it. But Georgia over Auburn was a game that I picked Auburn. I was not expecting Bo Nix to have such a bad day. But Bennett, the walk-on with 240 yards and a touchdown. Um, I like what Georgia has. I don't like what they're doing on offense right now. I feel like against bigger and better teams, Georgia is going to struggle. We, we'll see this this week as they play Tennessee uh, this coming Saturday, which will be our college pick game of the day. But I, I like Georgia sitting here at five. There's not a whole lot of complaints I can have. Didn't like week one. But defensively, their offensive line, their quarterback in Bennett is now starting to play pretty darn consistent. And, and they sold me with their convincing win over Auburn, only allowing seven points to Auburn, uh, or six points to Auburn, excuse me, and 27 for Georgia. So I'm going to go Georgia here at number five. Well, there you have it, another episode in the books. Make sure you're following us on all of our social media platforms as the locker room is doing exclusive content to certain social medias. So we only have things that are on uh, exclusively on YouTube, exclusively on Instagram TV. So if you want all things locker room, you've got to be following us on all things locker room. Make sure you're following us on Instagram, the locker room podcast 615. On Facebook, the locker room host Jacob on Twitter, TLR with Jacob. And on TikTok, the locker room 22. We really appreciate the love that we have gotten from tiktok so make sure you're following us so you can get exclusive content we want to thank fnx for all that they do for us make sure you hit that promo code at your checkout for 15 percent off once again i'm jacob courtright and this is the locker room